Um, the Afrolatchian poets sometimes travel together, and we went through um, northern Appalachia into Maryland um, a couple of times. And whenever we go, we pass this place called Negro Mountain <laughs> in the Alleghenies. And um, the first time we pass, we like pull, well, every time we, we go by, we, we pull over to the side of the road and take a picture by the sign. Um, because it's very interesting to us that a mountain would be named for that. And there's not a lot of information about it. And being poets and being writers, we decided to take what little we knew about Negro Mountain and write our own version. So this is my version. It's called Legend of Negro Mountain. And in honor of Amethyst, um, I have song lyrics in between the stanzas. I won't, I won't sing them. Um, for one, because this is, a, this is a melody that is forgotten. No one knows the tune anymore. Um, and second, I, you just don't want that. So um, this is called Legend of Negro Mountain. <clears throat> it would take a man black as loam to have a mountain named for his skin. Before any highways platted Allegheny crests, Nemesis took a bullet in his back while hewing down clay-skinned men. They parted before him, felled like saplings before axe and flame. I know moonrise, I know star rise, lay this body down. I walk in the moonlight, I walk in the starlight to lay this body down. Nemesis was buried in the third eye of the mountain where his blood had turned the soil black. On this, the same night he would join his ancestors, walking trees uprooted from the swamps he'd been born in. They followed Spica, their branches raking across the sky and blotting out the stars. They stayed bad dreams, lost leaves, bark, and limbs, lost a whole white winter to reach his body. I'll walk in the graveyard. I'll walk through the graveyard to lay this body down. I'll lie in the grave and stretch out my arms, lay this body down. The trees folded constellations into the ground where Nemesis fell. His ancestors, hauled by blood, followed these root walkers from swamp to summit. And like the trees, they remained stayed by his body long enough for a whole mountain to be named black as a bullet in skin. I go to judgment in the evening of the day when I lay this body down. My soul and your soul will meet in the day when I lay this body down. And now a roadkill poem. Um. <laughs> Not really, sort of, slow dance. I imagine the dying wasp is actually pirouetting along the rim of her next life and not this step. For days now, I have watched her charge every window pane on the top floor, only to fall here. And because she is a wasp and I was afraid of her sting, I let her alone, hoping someone else might upturn a palm or scrap of paper to usher her back into light and life. I should not be surprised. This is a place where critters come to expire. Last year, a moon rat up and died in our kitchen wall. And later, a bat found its way into the mouse trap alongside the same wall. Someone threw its petrified body out with the week's garbage. I step over the wasp, not quite willing to step on her because her life is yet propelled, however like an automaton's, by breath and whatever still throbs beneath her exoskeleton. Does she curse me as my soul's shadow falls across her brink? Does she wish upon me bad karma for not sending her sooner into next life? Was she the moon rat all along and later the bat, destined to repeat birth and death within my walls? Perhaps she will continue to be sent back. Next is something more repellent, something that spits or secretes, until I cast my bleeding, lily-livered heart behind an iron-clad veil. Then we will no longer circle one another for the duration of her afterlives. If I could crush her just this once, if she could endure just this death, 
Then perhaps whatever debt she owes the universe is rendered moot, and she is reborn as a surprise lily in some lovely field that no human with all our clumsy ineptitudes and moral misgivings can reach. Maybe when I see her tomorrow, her brass bullet of a body roiling along the step, I will resolve that no living thing should suffer this way. I will step on her. I will end her life. And maybe nothing happens. And she and I will both know she was never born to become anything but a dead wasp. Um, OK, so this is, the, um, this is the poem I was threatening to read earlier, Alchemist. And um, one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to live next door to a writer. Um, because instead of getting to know you, they'll just make up stories about you um, <laughs> and think that they know you. Um, this is called Alchemist. The woman next door says she don't have to ask if it was me or him rearranging the furniture last night. Don't take that much to grow a man the way you want him. She tells me how all a woman had to do to snag her the right man or cure one from being a terror was to scare up some nightshade. She says it used to be simpler when the world was simpler. Used to be in the South, you could find it just about anywhere on account of how liberal the law was with hanging men. You'd look for the mandrake right where he'd been hung and spasm the last of his seed into the earth. But she doesn't say spasmed his seed. She says something else, which means having an orgasm as you die. You had to harvest the plant before dawn on a Friday, and you'd sometimes get a four-foot root already bulging into a homunculus. But she doesn't say homunculus. She uses a racial slur. Then it'd want feeding, goat's milk, honey, dried mushroom, blood from a fresh cut. Eventually, that little thing would come to life, start moving around, wail like an infant if it didn't have its food. When it got adolescent old, you'd slit its throat root because after all, it's just a plant. Dry it out. Grind it down. Serve it in tea to the man you're wanting to do right. And that was that. What do you do now, I want to know, if you don't have a mandrake? She says, find someone who do. I know where a whole mess of them grow. Thank you.